Good morning, everyone. Glad to have you here this morning for our May Eggs and Issues breakfast. We're going to get our program underway, and we're glad that you've joined us either here in person or online. Uh, I'd like to open the morning with a uh, thank you to our mission members, uh, some of whom are in the room. Their logos are up on the screen. These are members who uh, invest over and above their membership level to support the work in the chamber. So can we have a round of applause for our mission members? <laughs> Glad to have you here for Exit Issues. Uh, those of you that are here in person, welcome. For those of you that are with us online, welcome to you also. We're going to go through some um, brief instructions for those of you that are online. If you'd like to ask questions via the chat function, uh, we will let you be able to do that. If you click on the More button with the little ellipsis above it at the top right of your screen, that will drop down a uh, menu. The first option there is the chat. If you click that, it'll open the chat box for you, and you'll be able to ask your questions, and we will get to them, as many of those as we can throughout the program. Um, with that, I'm going to introduce our MC for the morning. He's the chair of the board for 2021 from Beaumar Construction. Please give a round of applause for Mr. Len Marinaccio. <laughs> thanks, Ken. And thanks, everyone, for joining us this morning for our Age and Issues program. As you can see, once again, we've got an audience in person and an audience that's logged in virtually as we at the Chamber continue to try and get us back to uh, what we're calling our responsible normalcy in meetings. Our program this morning will feature Dr. Barry Butler, president of Embry Riddle Aeronautical University. In 1925, John Paul Riddle and T. Hickey Embry formed the Embry Riddle Company to teach the adventurous to fly. That partnership has produced more than 137,000 alumni and advanced the aviation and aerospace industries in our country and around the world. Today we'll learn what their future expansion plans hold for every riddle for our state and for our community. But before we introduce our speaker, we'd like to recognize our elected officials either in person or online and provide an opportunity for some sponsor remarks. So at this time, I'd like to recognize some special guests uh, online and in person this morning. Uh, online, we've got County Council Member Fred Lowry, and here in person, we have Daytona Beach Shores Mayor Nancy Miller. And Volusia County Tax Collector Will Roberts. Did I miss anybody who, who may have snuck in after we started here? Okay, good. Thank you guys so much for, for attending. We really appreciate it. And of course, we have many generous members who go above and beyond to help us bring relevant and meaningful programs to our members and to our community. Our presenting sponsor, Halifax Health, is here this morning. Please welcome uh, John Guthrie for a few minutes. Good morning. How is everybody? So I have a question for you. <clears throat> Dr. Veal, the head of our emergency department, said we are not going to get past COVID. We are going to live with COVID. So do you guys like it when I tell you what's going on at the hospital? Because I totally don't have to. I'm tired of it. Do you want to hear what's going on or not? Yes. All right, I will. I feel like I've been labeled <clears throat> the face of COVID, but that's okay. Um, we have 19 patients today, which is way better than about two weeks ago because we had about 51. So we really did see a spike, um, probably um, due to all the reasons that, um, that everybody's already pontificated about. So I'm not going to get into that. But, um, you know, it is coming down, which is good. We are still, we reviewed yesterday our masking policy. And I talked with Dr. Miles, our chief um, quality officer. And he said, if you're vaccinated, you're wearing a mask to protect other people. So I think, you know, that's kind of the, the way thing, people are looking at things because we do it. We still don't know a lot. We still don't know a lot. And starting Monday, we will start um, making the vaccine available for 12 year olds and up. If they come, they have to either bring a legal guardian with them or have an adult with them and a note from a legal guardian. So that's it for COVID. Any questions about that? I wanna move on to something else. Whenever I kind of think about what I'm gonna say at these events, I think about what's relevant to today. And with Dr. Butler here, I think it makes sense to talk about our relationship in um, aerospace physiology. How about that? Aerospace physiology. So Dr. Karen Gaines, the dean of uh, dean at Embry-Riddle of Arts and Sciences, 
and Dr. Miles, Steve Miles, our chief uh, quality officer, got together and started to look at the future. People going to the moon, people going to the space station, people going to Mars. And they created a program to create physicians and providers to be able to take care of those people. And that takes two things. That takes an understanding of aerospace, which every riddle, there is no one better. I think we all agree with that. And it takes access to physicians. And so this partnership started with 10 majors. And now I believe we're over 100 people majoring in aerospace physiology right here. And one of the capstone projects, which is kind of weird, but I understand it's necessary, is that one of, um, one of the students in that program is actually developing a pharmaceutical to help irritable bowel disease, irritable bowel syndrome in space. And I think that's pretty cool, not the irritable pal part, but we have a capstone person, a capstone project right here in our community that is going to have an impact across the universe. And I think that's important. The other thing I want to bring up is because of the relationships that we have, we are the contingency hospital. Halifax Health is the contingency hospital for NASA and SpaceX. And so that speaks very highly of the, the belief that the, the, uh, the system has in our whole area and we're, how we're able to handle events and um, emergencies should they come along. So welcome and uh, I'll give it back to you, Let it, thanks. Thanks, John. I think that's probably the main thing I'm gonna take away from this is the irritable bowel. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, our, our other presenting sponsor this morning, Daytona Beach News Journal, I don't see Diane or, or Clayton uh, here this morning, so we'd just like to, to thank them as always for the, the incredible job that they do in our community and for always supporting the chamber. So then at this time, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. In 2017, Dr. Barry Butler became the sixth president of Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. As president of the world's leading institution of higher education, focusing on aviation and aerospace, Dr. Butler oversees more than 34,000 students through its two traditional campuses located in Daytona Beach and in Prescott, Arizona, and worldwide through Embry-Riddle's state-of-the-art online campus. Under Dr. Butler's presidency, Embry-Riddle continues to expand its degree programs, offering more than 100 bachelor's, master's, and PhD degrees. The research part provides unique collaborative opportunities for students, companies, and our community to advance technology and provide the foundation for startups to grow by its technology-focused ecosystem in partnerships with aviation aerospace pipelines. Before his time at Embry-Riddle, Dr. Butler was the executive vice president and provost for the University of Iowa. He earned his bachelor's and master's in aeronautical and astronautical engineering and a PhD in mechanical engineering for the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Please welcome Dr. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, appreciate the introduction. Well, thank you for uh, having me. First of all, can you hear me okay back there? Yes. Thank you. And um, I just wanna add one comment on the introduction earlier about the uh, aerospace physiology program. You, you mentioned two parts of it that make it work. There's actually a third part that's been incredible uh, for this program, and that was a significant uh, gift uh, from the estate of the, um, the, the late Helen Wessel. Some of you may have known her, um, a community member and closely connected to the university, also an art enthusiast. And because of her support, um, we're able to give significant scholarships uh, specifically to women uh, going into that particular area. She had a, she had a real passion for encouraging young women to get into the sciences and she loved Embry Riddle and so that's a significant piece of what philanthropy has done to what you mentioned is a significant program so I just wanted to add that in there the other thing I want to add in is that um, you know you heard the history of Embry Riddle back in 1925-26 uh, when it was founded uh, I think another significant point in time that's important to this audience because of the, uh, the business nature of it and the economics of it is that um, in the mid 1960s, many of you know, uh, it was um, located uh, in Miami, the Miami area, and was relocated to Daytona Beach. There's a lot of great photographs of, of moving the entire university over a weekend in the back of some of your uh, predecessors' trucks and local businesses and things like that. And 
I still look at that as a, a moment in our local history here in terms of um, visionary people that looked at the impact of a university like that on the community. Now, on day one, it wasn't like it is today, but, but people had a vision for the future and those individuals really need recognition. I've met a few of them. I know um, many have passed away since then. I've had a chance to meet some of them during my short time here. Uh, and I just thank them you know, over and over again. I said that, 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 that was quite a vision to bring it here. And secondly, to put it at the airport. Um, many university presidents would cringe at the idea of putting the university at an airport. Uh, in fact, I think probably all but me, but, um, <laughs> but it was an amazing decision, quite frankly, and it, it what, it's what really sets us apart. And you'll see some of that when I talk about some of the businesses that are growing around us um, because of talent and because of location and because of the business climate around here is being so, being so positive. So with that, let me just uh, go through here. I'm going to set a timer so I don't, I don't go overboard. I want to make sure I, I'm sorry about this. I just like to do this as a way to respect your time. Um, let me start with uh, just a few things. I'm really here to focus a lot about the um, growth and expansion that we're experiencing and um, try to tie it in a little bit with number one, the current state of where we are as an institution, but also the impact of the last year on us. Uh, you've probably seen headlines out there about the impact of um, COVID on higher education. Uh, it's taken a heavy hit on a lot of schools, many schools. Uh, we're not in that category. We've actually done incredibly well uh, over the last year. We've had some significant um, you know, growth in enrollment. Uh, we've had great financial success. We've had two bond rating agency reviews in the last six months, and both of them have given us upgrades, uh, both uh, Moody's as well as um, Fitch, uh, which is highly unusual this past year for higher education. A lot of it's got to do with just good, uh, we have a great uh, senior financial person. The other person, before I go too far, I want to recognize right up front here is Rodney Cruz. He's our chief operating officer and senior vice president. And a lot of what you're going to see here is, is his responsibility, and, and he's made it happen. So I'm just the, I'm just the voice. Uh, but Rodney here is his wife. Um, I had a chance last week, thanks to Congressman Waltz, uh, to uh, be part of a congressional uh, testimony on the National Science Foundation's budget. Uh, they're looking at growing that agency, and um, it's widely regarded as a standard for um, you know, advancing science. You may know the history. It was actually started right after World War II as a way to get universities, industry, and the defense group all kind of working together and advancing science and the basic, uh, basic science, basically. What I spoke about at that point was though the role of smaller universities like Embry Riddle, and I would classify us as smaller. While we have 34,000 students, our residential campus here is around 7,000 this year. It'll probably be about 7,400 next year uh, in the fall. That's what we're projecting right now. That's still small by the standards of what you would consider the big research engines, uh, the, the UFs, the FSUs, places like that that are that are just you know they're they're large research intensive universities. My position in this uh, testimony was schools like Embry-Riddle can play a significant role if people pay attention. And in other words, we have a lot to offer. And part of it's got to do with our connectivity with uh, industry. You know, we, we're not shy about saying what we do, what the majors we have and the work that we do supports something beyond college. So in other words, projects our students out into the industry. In our case, the aerospace aviation industry and all the businesses that go that go with it. And I, uh, I got a pretty good uh, response from it. So I wanted to thank the congressman. He's not here, obviously, but just for, for allowing me to speak on behalf of a lot of schools and particularly uh, ours. Um, so this last year has been quite interesting. The, the, the word of the, on the street was pivot. I think everybody in their businesses had to deal with that. Uh, we did too. Um, what was unique about uh, our, uh, our uh, situation, when, when everybody, you know, all universities went online last a year ago, uh, March of 2020, uh, we did too, we, we, we shifted the last few weeks of the semester to online. Uh, what we had to our advantage was part of our campus, uh, you've heard about the Prescott, Arizona campus, Daytona Beach, the third campus is called Worldwide. And um, its, its headquarters is right there on Bevel and in, uh, in Williamson. And um, those, those buildings that are stuck there, that, that is the top ranked online 
um, campus in the, in the world, effectively, in the U.S. by U.S. News and World Report, which effectively makes it in the world. They're number one. They, they do it the best. And they have for like the last 10 years, thanks to Chancellor John Wattred, I think many of you know John, does a wonderful job uh, delivering education all over the world. We were able to take advantage of that with the residential campus. So the folks here uh, in Daytona Beach could easily transfer over to the online environment for that spring semester. And so that allowed us then to really kind of get up and go quickly where a lot of schools were struggling with the online. Um, we, uh, we, we decided as a team, we have a leadership team that gets together uh, daily. Uh, now we're doing it just two days a week, but we did every day for the last year. Uh, there was a period where we're even doing it on weekends, but um, to find out what's the latest, what's happening, what do we need to do today to, to deal with this? Uh, as Mr. Cruz says, this is our first pandemic for all of us, right? Nobody has a blueprint. It's not like dealing with a hurricane or something where you've got a game plan. And so what was our game plan for dealing with the pandemic? Uh, got together, we decided to go back face to face uh, last summer. So we were one of the first schools to actually get students back on campus. We did it about mid-summer. It was around July, early July is when we brought the students back, those who were in summer school. We used the summer as kind of a, a trial to see how things worked. Um, we have about maybe, uh, probably about one-seventh of our population will be there in the summer. So it's a lower density. You can try things out. Uh, it allowed us to get campus ready for the fall when all the students came back. That turned out to be um, a pretty good decision because number one, it worked really well. Uh, we learned from our mistakes and we were able to fix things by the time the big student population came back in the fall. So we were back in the fall face to face. We had about 75% of our classes in the fall and then this past spring face to face delivery. Uh, but we had a lot of safety protocols in place and that helped us an awful lot throughout it. Now, before I go on to say a few other things, what I'd like to do here is to show you a video. This is a video that we share with uh, government entities, uh, businesses that we're trying to recruit, uh, anything that deals with the business side of what we're doing. So let me just share this with you. It's just a few minutes. Hopefully the, it'll run here. Let's just let it go. In a year of nowhere, Every Riddle Aeronautical University has continued climbing toward the stars. We are fulfilling the promise of the future and elevating the communities where we live and work. The amount of economic development Embry Riddle is bringing um, not only to our community, both here and in Arizona, to the state and to the country. In many ways, Embry Riddle is an engine of aerospace industry generating high-paying jobs, launching innovative technologies, and fueling economic growth. Embry-Riddle's ability to put ingenuity to work, showcased by new records and yearly research awards, and our growing global influence, have helped us give the nation an economic boost estimated at $2.3 billion. When it comes to making a difference today and shaping a brighter tomorrow, we stand apart. We're educating skilled workers ready to meet the challenges of a future driven by technology, giving them key opportunities to continue great careers in Florida and Arizona. Our workforce not only powers growth and innovation, it generates critical tax revenue in Florida and Arizona. And the spending power of Embry-Riddle alumni elevates both states, adding nearly $1 billion to their economies. In spite of unprecedented challenges, our enrollment continues to increase, with more than 33,000 students now studying on three campuses. This growth reflects our commitment to student success and dedication to fulfilling Florida's need for a high-caliber workforce. Innovation at a university really starts with the faculty and students. That's where the passion is for new ideas. That's where people want to try uh, to create things that are going to add to the industry. What we do at a university is we also then provide that ecosystem for them to be able to take those ideas and move them along the spectrum of creating businesses, being able to test new ideas, and move them to the marketplace. Embry-Riddle's true influence extends far beyond its campuses. In Florida, the Micaplex Research Park has already generated 500 high-paying jobs. With an economic impact estimated at $90 million, becoming the go-to center for aviation and aerospace advancement. Coming here to the Micaplex and to Florida has allowed us to access talent 
that was uh, very hard for us to, to get beforehand and it has allowed us to work with talent from many different nationalities and many different cultures that has given our company a diversity that it didn't have and a creative edge that it didn't have. The advantages and the opportunities available for uh, businesses in the Microplex include access to world-class facilities, uh, resources within the Volusia County area and the state of Florida. So uh, there, there's a great ecosystem that is centered here at the Microplex that serves as a hub to allow businesses to take advantage and tap into those networks. The Eagle Flight Research Center is now part of this leading edge facility pushing the boundaries of flight and opening up new research opportunities at the northern tip of Florida's Space Triangle. Training tomorrow's workforce. Elevating innovation. Fueling economic power. Embry-Riddle is the global leader in aviation and aerospace education. A key industry partner and a vital part of every community we serve. As we look to the promise ahead, we can say with confidence that at Embry-Riddle, all systems are go. So I hope I gave you a sort of a brief overview of some of the things that are going on. I want to share a little more in depth here in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, this photo actually says a lot about why we are today, you know, where we are um, compared to what happened over the last year. One of our students, um, you know, we, we talk about student success in a lot of different ways. You talk about their academic success, their job placement, all of those sorts of things that you typically think about as a college student. Um, one area, you know, when we started this year, uh, we, we asked the students to be a part of the solution. We really did, as well as the staff. And I see Athletic, athletic Director JP, John Phillips back there as well. He did the same thing with the athletes, you know, trying to get everybody on board to help us get through this. And uh, this is a state here, and it's really, it's, it's beyond academics. In this case, it's compliance. It's getting young people who understand they can be part of a solution. Um, and they really did step up to the plate, and I just want to recognize the students uh, for that because um, it was a difficult year for students all over the country, quite frankly. Uh, but as I told them back in August, um, focus on things that you can influence, not on things that you have no control over. And they did. They stepped up and they did what they could, so I want to recognize our students as well. Um, that's what campus looked like back in uh, August as we got back to school, a little different from usual. Those uh, skateboarders have their masks on and their um, you know, books in their hands and coffee and everything else, but they're, uh, they're trying to stay uh, safe, and they did. It was a pretty good year. We had a very low uh, incidence of inf infections. And uh, just to give you one statistic uh, to, to kind of think about, from the time we opened last summer until now, uh, we have accumulated 130,000 hours of flying and simulator time. 130,000. That's about the, if you look at airlines, that would be like a mid sized regional airline, what they would fly in a given year. So it gives you a perspective of how many hours uh, we've been flying. Those are close environments in a, in a flight deck or in a simulator. Uh, but again, it it uh, it was with safety as the as the first priority, and uh, they did an amazing job. It's a little hard out there when it's 95 degrees and you're standing out on the ramp doing a pre-flight on an airplane. And you got a mask on, but they did it. I mean, and and now it's starting to to relax, and so I think that was the reward that they're seeing. Um, the programs do incredibly well. You know, as I mentioned before, our worldwide campus um, continues to have the number one ranking by U.S. This is kind of our standard. All your businesses have your own sort of ways of, you know, rankings and ratings. Ours is U.S. News and World Report. That's one of a hundred that rank, but they're they're really kind of considered the the top standard now. And um, we got number one again in online bachelor's degrees in the whole in the whole country, and I consider that the world since the U.S. has the best higher education system out there. Uh, our Prescott campus has the number one aerospace engineering program for non-PhD programs. The one here is ranked like number 10 or 12 or something because they have a PhD program. So there's different categories, but nevertheless, we have two programs that are right up there. Um, for, I think, the sixth year in a row, our, our um, online degrees for veterans have been ranked number one in the country. That's pretty significant. Um, about half of our students enrolled in worldwide are, are in the military or recent retirees. 
using the, the VA benefits. So about 12,500 uh, military personnel are taking our programs. Another fact that I looked up that's pretty interesting, um, in the United States Air Force at any given time, I think there's 225 uh, general officers, so anybody from a brigadier general up to a four star. And uh, we, we did a quick survey recently. And of, of those who are active or re retired within the last five years, we found over a hundred of them with an Ember Riddle degree. And hundred, I mean, hundred general officers in the United States Air Force uh, with a degree from Ember Riddle, many of them had them through the worldwide. In other words, they got in the service and then they, they knew they were on the fast track and they got a degree through our worldwide campus. So that's a pretty significant number. Um, you know, the online piece, as I said before, is pretty significant. We, we trans transitioned pretty quickly. The other one I want to mention just quickly is our, our uh, business program, online business program is, is ranked number 10. And, and so it's moving up, it's moving up the ladder. And that's, I've asked the Dean of that college to get it up to number one here in the next few years. And so that one's doing incredibly well. Uh, the outcomes are, are pretty significant in terms of uh, placement, jobs, salaries. You can see some of the numbers there in terms of what the students get. This last year has been a little down like it's been everywhere. The message right now is it's picking up pretty quickly. Um, you know, at any given time, uh, we hire, uh, we, we employ about 200 flight instructors uh, for, our, for our flight program. That's a, and that's about a quarter of the university, so about 200 instructors. And that's usually the pipeline from there before they go off to their jobs in the airlines or commercial or whatever they're gonna do. Uh, that slowed down to a, a nothing you know, during COVID. Um, right, now, right now, we're expecting to lose many of those this summer, up to 40 or 50 of them because of the hiring that's starting up again. So that's a good sign for everybody. I think it's, uh, it's kind of our early, sort of early sign that things are moving in the right direction. I want to shift gears and use the remaining time to talk about the business piece of it here, because this is really important. Uh, you heard about the Micaplex in the video, um, right on Clyde Morris there, and, um, and as you drive, but just uh, basically between the parallel runways at the airport. Um, I arrived in 2017 and, and we cut the ribbon like a month later. Within a couple of years, um, this thing was full. Uh, we have uh, significant occupation. One of the companies is right here. One of our companies from day one, Van Data Services here in the front row. And uh, Todd, and, uh, and we appreciate you guys being with us from day one. So it's, a, it's been a good, good partnership. But uh, that place is doing incredibly well. And what I want to talk about now is sort of our growth plan for the future and a little bit about some of the businesses that are there. You heard some of the numbers. I won't go through them again. One of the things to mention here is we're growing. We're building another building. I'll show you a picture of it here in just a second. And we have plans. You saw it in the video. There was a, a rendering of another building we're looking at for the next couple of years, and that would be the uh, Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center. And that, if that goes up, it'll be right there on Clyde Morris as well. So that part of town is going to be significant. You saw this. This is from an independent outside group, Washington Economics Group. We, we do this every few years, the, uh, looking at the economic impact of the entire university, and then we segment it out to Florida and Arizona. Arizona campus is about half the size of Daytona, and it does not have the research park that we have here. So uh, you get a sort of a you know, sense for where, how that works. Uh, this is a rendering, uh, excuse me, this is a rendering of a, um, the um, uh, manufacturing facility we'll be putting up. It's basically right across from the Micaplex on Clyde Morris. Uh, this building um, is, uh, is already uh, leased. One of our tenants from the Micaplex is going to be using it for manufacturing uh, weather flow. Uh, they've uh, pretty much taken the entire building. So you'll see that coming up there right on, uh, right on the corner of uh, basically Clyde Morris and then Bellevue, right? And so right there, and that would be the southeast corner. Uh, it'll be a light manufacturing facility, and um, it's just the beginning for more and more to come. So it's kind of nice to have a building kind of taken over before you before you put a spade in the ground. I think that helps uh, helps in a lot of ways. But it's nice to see that. The one thing that had, that a lot of these businesses have in common, um, I think when you look at them, and I'll share with you a few of them that are there now, um, there, there's, a, there's sort of a certain factors that come into play, I think, when they make the decision to move here. One is the business climate here. So, you know, sort of, you know, some of you folks that work in the economic development side, you know, attracting businesses here is, is not that difficult. You, you know, it's a good business climate for people. Number two um, really is the talent, access to talent. Uh, these places need good people 
And when we walk them on campus and say, look, you've got 7,000 students here that would love to stay in Daytona Beach, um, they, they don't even have to move in their apartment. They just go to work for you the day after they graduate. That's really attractive to have that talent readily available uh, for those businesses. And that's played a pretty significant role. The third piece is the facility. So uh, we invested four years ago in the Microplex. It's not just the building, there's some pretty unique equipment in there. And with some of the arrangements we have, businesses that don't necessarily uh, have the capital to buy equipment um, can work with us on using some of the things we have, like uh, pretty advanced 3D printers and things like that. So it's kind of a nice uh, sort of a ecosystem uh, for business. Let me just share a little bit about some of those businesses. What these four have in common here, uh, these are all uh, businesses with international uh, bases, uh, international headquarters, but have a base here at the Microplex or in our research park. And I'll, I'll share a little bit about that, each one of these and, and, um, and what they've been doing. So the first one, uh, C-MAX Aircraft, uh, this is basically a Brazilian company making ultralight um, amphibious aircraft that you see here. Uh, we work with them um, in terms of uh, design work, composite materials for future aircrafts, and some, some simulation type work for um, you know, the aerodynamics and how they fly and land in water and things like that. So again, having access to talent, people who know that, uh, that, that material, uh, it's right here in town. So that's kind of a nice one. Uh, second one is TechFit Digital Surgery. This is a group from Columbia, um, and uh, it's a biomedical type devices, implant type devices. You see a few examples here, uh, both in terms of a cranium type cap and then also a kind of a jaw type thing here. Uh, what's unique about this is uh, you think, well, that's not really aerospace, but a lot of industries sort of have spun off from technology that has come up through the aerospace uh, uh, world over the years. We all hear about, you know, Tang and astronauts and NASA, but there's a lot of, of real technology. Example is analog brakes in your vehicles. So we take those for granted nowadays. But if you look back at the history of that, uh, it was really an aerospace technology evolved, worked its way into vehicles. Um, a lot of things like that. Uh, vehicle airbags, for example, came through the rocket industry because of the propellants and that. So again, here you have, um, you know, aerospace industry, a lot of additive manufacturing. That's, that's, that's you know, techno speak for 3D printing, basically. And so you have devices that are able to be printed um, for, in this case, implants. And so a very, very good example of how you can use the aerospace sort of technology. Uh, Print Tech is again, another one that's there. This is a UK based company, basically making uh, circuitry for satellites. That's what you see there in that, uh, on, that on the right hand side there, specialty type circuit components for communication satellites. And then Aralis, this is also, uh, this is uh, have their headquarters in Ireland. Uh, we met with them actually three years ago, I think, at the Paris Air Show uh, group was was there and talked to them about relocating in the U.S. and ended up getting them into the uh, Daytona Beach area. They make also specialty type communication devices for satellites, as well as precision landing aircraft equipment. So when aircraft are, you hear about planes being able to land in sort of almost zero visibility, it requires very high precision type uh, electronics and that's kind of their, their specialty area. A couple of others that I want to talk about these in terms of just uh, companies that are kind of fast growing. And um, so we have different levels of businesses, you know, in terms all the way from entrepreneurial startups, people that have located a U.S. base on our campus and others that are just sort of in that transition uh, on their way up. But these are three that I just want to mention quickly. Uh, One Sky, what's unique about this is a lot of different products. They're part of a larger consortium. Uh, but but the, in this particular case, it's access to talent who understand data, data science. There's a, primarily in the business jet, the private jet area, but there's a lot of information related to optimizing flights, fuel requirements, scheduling, uh, pricing, all these sorts of things. And like any of your businesses, uh, access to data and having people who understand how to take those data and use them to better your business. That's kind of what they have here is really a kind of access to the software talent that we have. Uh, weather flow, we mentioned them earlier in terms of these devices. You'll see some of these actually on the roof of the uh, Microplex for testing. And then the manufacturing is going to be across the street in the, in the new facility. Um, again, a business that, that is um, doing quite well and moving in the right direction. I think they have about 10,000 of these products out there now uh, in the, uh, out there. This one here is a, is a Vertigo Arrow. This is basically 
Um, you've heard a lot about electric aircraft and uh, urban mobility vehicles. Those are some buzzwords for, you know, sort of the next phase of aircraft that might be coming out there. They will be coming at some point. In fact, they're already doing in, um, in, uh, in some of the Brazilian cities, some of the Sao Paulo, for example, you know, urban mobility, getting people around from point A to point B, uh, kind of the Uber of the sky type, type model in very congested areas. Um, in terms of electric propulsion, uh, this particular group here um, is looking at not necessarily the vehicle itself, that takes a lot of capital to get into aircraft construction and, and manufacturing, I should say, but more the propulsion and some of the control logic. So it's sort of producing those devices that will go into these things. Uh, I want to mention just quickly a couple of others here. Um, uh, Sensitech, Census, GRD, Biomechanics, and uh, Modularity Space. Let me just share a few things. You saw uh, Raymond here on the video. Uh, this is a guy who was in the Marines. He was uh, getting his master's degree with Embry-Riddle. Um, I attended his commencement, which was at the uh, Pensacola Naval Air Station at the museum there. I shook his hand when he got his master's degree, and he, he turned to me afterwards, after the ceremony, he said, I'll, I'll be in Daytona um, next week. You know, we're moving there. We've got the business set up at the Microplex. He started really with an idea. It's got to do basically with sensors that go in gas turbine engines, whether it's on aircraft, power plants, you name it, anything that's a rotating type uh, uh, power device. They make a sensor for monitoring temperature, and it sounds pretty sounds pretty straightforward. It's very difficult. They have been able to generate millions of dollars in um, in funds to help that business move, and they're doing quite well. Um, census, this is you know, kind of the, the photo here speaks to it. It's basically an autonomous vehicle. Drones is the common term that people use, um, and uh, in this case, you can see what it's doing. It's flying over power lines and and uh, and basically monitoring them for uh, damage and things like that. If you're familiar with the industry, um, helicopters fly over these things. You think about who's going to, I would not fly, I don't fly a helicopter, but I would not fly a helicopter, you know, 10 feet over a power line, you know, eight hours a day to try to monitor for defects. They can do it all with sensors that pick up on defects. If there's any kind of a hot spot, they measure temperature, things like that. But what's unique about this is it's not just this application, but agricultural things and others. So they're doing quite well. Uh, modularity space, this is basically kind of the, uh, the Uber of the sky. It's a way to sort of ride share. You can, you can send different things up into uh, orbit uh, on a common platform. And, uh, and then GRD biomechanics, again, uh, using some aerospace technology in the biomechanics side of it, you know, sort of the lightweight composite materials and things like that. Uh, basically, in, in this case, showing you the knee brace. Um, and then uh, I think the last one I want to end with here and then just let you ask questions if you have any. Um, space domain awareness. This is sort of uh, the equivalent of uh, sort of, um, sort of uh, identifying license plates on satellites. You know, if you, if you follow the industry at all, there's a lot of stuff up there in space. And you figure, how do you track this stuff? How do you monitor? You, well, just last weekend, you know, there was this there was this um, Chinese uh, booster coming down, and, and you know th that was a little unusual. But the uncertainty and where it was going to hit uh, kind of gets your awareness. There's a lot of satellites orbiting, and generally they die out and burn up on their way back down. That was an unusual circumstance. But just try to identify where they are. And so this this young man here is um, is actually in the uh, Marine Corps. He works with our ROTC group here. And he started a business in terms of tagging those, you know, here, here's how you identify um, the, uh, the different pieces of space, um, I was gonna call it junk, but space uh, con content that's up there. And uh, yeah, and um, I mean, it's kind of a neat thing that someone like that, he's, uh, he's a young man, he's doing incredibly well, um, and uh, Major Lee, uh, and uh, he's not in the Microplex yet, but we're hoping to get him in there. And that's kind of a, a way to look at it. I think what I'll do at this point is, um, is just skip ahead, but there's one last one here. Uh, this is Jared Isaacman. Um, he's a, uh, one of these kids who dropped out of uh, high school, actually, and uh, started a business um, and uh, at his home. And uh, the deal was he had to finish high school uh, for his parents to let him do this. He started it, turned it into a uh, pretty significant, it's got to do with online payment, kind of like PayPal type stuff. Um, eventually sold it for a couple of billion dollars, um, has gone off into other businesses. Uh, but as he got interested in aviation and aerospace, uh, he knew that uh, he needed a degree. 
And so he went to Emory Riddle's online program. And while he was basically running these businesses, got one of our degrees online. And so he's got an Emory Riddle degree. He is um, going to be the uh, he's, he's uh, the, the first uh, civilian crew to go into space. They'll be going up in the fall. You can you can follow it, and um, it's uh, it's pretty significant because he handpicked the other three um, astronauts to go with him, uh, and um, based on their experience, one is a nurse from St. Jude's um, who um, who uh, basically there are like fifty thousand people who applied. Uh, but one of the others is another Andrew Riddle graduate. So of the four, two of them will be Riddle students, graduates. Uh, they're going up in the fall. It's on SpaceX. Basically, you'll see it launched from south of here. Uh, they're doing some elliptical type orbit. They're doing some experiments and they'll come back down after, I think, a week or so. Uh, but um, it's pretty significant when you got um, some sort of people like that out there sort of uh, setting the standards for the future. So Jared is uh, is a pretty neat guy. We had him, he, he, with all of that going on, he took a few minutes away from his business and, and had a, a session with the students about two weeks ago. He was down at the Cape and they set up a little studio down there for him and he was answering questions and doing things like that. So with that, let me end just by saying thank you uh, for, um, for being uh, uh, partners with us, all of you as a community. Uh, we, we wouldn't um, obviously be successful without the community that's around us and the, the types of work. We work really well with a lot of different groups here. This is how to engage with us uh, and uh, various things that we do, basically just our website there. And um, with that, I'll end. And if there's any time for questions, I'm not sure what your schedule's like. But thank you for having me. And hopefully uh, you learned a little something today about how we're doing and what's going on. We didn't have any of the, of the little cards come up, but we can just take questions from the floor if anybody has them, if you want to, if sure. anybody has any happy questions to, you want yeah. to ask for Dr. Bowman this morning. Yes. yes. Oh, I'll just go ahead. Yeah. Back over to you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, what, what kind of, I know you have your industrial park uh, area there. What kind of square footage can you accommodate there? Uh, what, what, are your, what do you see coming as far as square footage? Yeah, so for those online, just like I repeated, it's basically what's, what do we see in terms of square footage at the research park and what sort of expansion. We actually, uh, for that, I'll ask Rodney for the numbers, but we actually have done some planning for the future and we actually have some uh, land across the street from there. And that actually can go upwards of what, 500,000? 700,000. 700,000 square feet eventually. That's, so we've got all that in our minds. In terms of what we have right now, it's uh, between the Micaplex and the others, maybe about 100,000 square feet. So, um, so that's kind of the scale of things. Uh, right now, we have the building will be going up across Clyde Morris for manufacturing. And then the one that I that showed up in the video, that's on Clyde Morris. That would be on the west side, uh, kind of butting right up against the taxiway there. Uh, that's about another 30,000 square feet. 60, 60 okay, 60,000. And that'll be more kind of similar to the Micaplex innovation space, offices, business startups, things like that. So we're hoping to get that going here in the next couple of years. We got some hurdles to get there first, but nothing major. Uh, that'll pretty much take care of the area that you're familiar with now. And then, and then past that, growth will be across the street. Sir? Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you. That's very interesting. As far as the, uh, I have a lot of interest in the new zone. I'm hearing about that, how cool that was. I'm curious about the, the utilization of it, any revenue generation, how things are going as far as expectations. Yeah, so the questions about the wind tunnel that went in just uh, really opened about a year and a half ago, I think. Uh, it's, um, it's first of all, it's state of the art. It's pretty significant. It's multi-use. We use it for teaching. Uh, so our students are actually over there calibrating it for some of their classes. So it's used heavily for a classroom environment. And then we also built a, um, a room there that actually is can be isolated. So for businesses that want to have people there working on their own testing, in terms of the actual uses we have, but Weatherflow is using it a little bit and a couple of others. I think we had a contract on a helicopter type project. Yes, sir. Uh, census. <coughs> census. Census has used that uh, facility as well. And uh, we really don't see it as revenue generating, but we see it as a platform for a company's success. You know, it's just yeah. another tool in the toolbox for them to be able to use. Guys, just to give you a sense for the size of it and that, it's uh, it's about five feet high. I mean, I can almost stand up in it, five feet diameter. 
and uh, the test section, which is the important part, is probably a good 10 feet long. That's pretty significant in the wind tunnel world. But more importantly, the the flow, the airflow that goes through there is um, is is very well maintained. So uh, you can you can keep low turbulence, which is very important for some experiments. A lot of really good diagnostics in there, and it can go up to about um, kind of around maybe. 200 miles per hour, maybe in terms of wind speed. So it's a pretty significant piece of hardware. Yes. So um, we the question was about SpaceX and our relationship with them. So I, I, I looked online recently. Short answer is yes. Um, not with him personally, but uh, we, we, we keep trying. <laughs> but. Um, the, uh, I looked online recently, um, uh, LinkedIn does these business surveys periodically, and they listed, uh, somebody had written, so, you know, what schools do they hire from? And I looked it up. The number one school was the University of Southern California, which if you're familiar, Hawthorne is right pretty close to USC. That's where their facility is for um, both their, their um, control room as well as all the manufacturing. But um, second on the list was Embry-Riddle. And uh, we have something like, I want to say 175 um, uh, people from Riddle who work there. Um, third on the list was like uh, Michigan or some of these little places up north there. And, I, you know, <laughs> and, uh, and then on down the line. And so I, I was pretty proud of that. I mean, it was pretty significant uh, to have that many people um, at a place like that. Uh, we've invited him uh, for uh, commencement addresses and we'll keep at it. Um, obviously a pretty busy guy, but um, I, I would tell you, if, if I was able to succeed on that, I think our students would uh, carry me around campus for uh, <laughs> <laughs> they they'd, be, they'd be very happy, let's just say. <laughs> well, listen, thank you so much again for all that you guys do for helping us. I know our relationships with the community is strong and we appreciate it. And we're gonna keep doing our part. Uh, it's a great community and uh, we know the importance of of getting these businesses going and um, hiring people and contributing to the economy around here. So thanks a lot. Have a good day. Thanks again, Dr. Butler. You know, it, it's it's impossible to overstate the impact that uh, that Embry Riddle has on our community. Uh, we owe such a debt of gratitude, like you said, to those folks that loaded you up in their pickup trucks and, and drove you up here those many years ago. But um, and also to our chamber that the. the uh, the contribution they make to our chamber that, that Rodney does. Um, I should have mentioned this before, but it, uh, as most of you know, you know Rodney's been a, a cornerstone member of our executive committee here for years, and the dedication that, that he puts into that, um, I'm sure it's probably rival only by what he does for the university. So thank you, Rodney, for that as well. Um, with, with that all said, I'll turn it back over to, uh, to Nancy to close us out. Thank you, Lynn, and thank you, Dr. Butler, as well. Um, I hope that everybody walks away with just a bit more pride in the fact that we have not only the physical presence of Embry Riddle sitting here right in our own backyard, but the way they signal Daytona Beach and the opportunity here internationally just by the virtue of their location here and their outreach. I have the opportunity to work very closely with Embry Riddle as we recruit new businesses to the community. So proud that I've been at the table on many of those that are in the microplex and appreciate again, as, as Len said, the relationship we have with Rodney and Dr. Butler. What a fabulous presentation today. So I hope everybody will become cheerleaders for the university and continue to talk about it with pride in, in, in our community and beyond. Just a couple of upcoming events to share with you. Um, this kind of, kind of after hearing about all of this, we have a business after hours coming up at 18. Um, and it is a Dave and Buster's, but they're fun events. That, like you can let your hair down a little bit and enjoy and networking with like-minded people that care about the community and want to build their circle of influence. So we invite you out to that on the 18th. I do want you all to mark your calendars that were a couple of really key events. Uh, one is June 8th. That will be our welcome back to our legislative delegation and it'll be in the afternoon. Uh, so it'll be a 3.30 event and we encourage all of you to get that on your calendars. And then very importantly, and we are so blessed with Glenn's leadership here at the chamber and one of his goals is to bring responsible normalcy back. You know, we are a chamber of commerce. We believe business needs to be done. We also respect that we need to do it safely. Um, everybody knows our annual meeting is usually the largest business event in the area and the most well attended and, and looked forward to. We had to hold the first part of it virtually back in was January, 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 where we presented our awards and Len, you know, received the gavel. 
But one of the most important parts of that is the social and the networking, us getting together face to face. So we are doing what we're calling extra innings in July 22nd. Everybody that's been a part of our annual meeting as sponsors, anybody who isn't can come as an individual or as, as a corporate table. We're going to be over at our ballpark and we're going to have a great networking opportunity. We will revisit our awards, we'll revisit uh, Lens leadership and in the past leadership of Bob Lloyd. So come on out July 22nd. It'll be casual. It is going to be outdoors. And so, and, and some of us are even going to be wearing our favorite team um, jerseys. Some, some of you will be able to guess what mine will be. Um, but anyway, we invite you five to eight, come on out. And we're so honored uh, to continue to bring back events in a, in a, a respectful way. My guess is that our chairman is going to start ripping the Band-Aid off of, of the virtual piece of it. At least in this hybrid fashion, we want to get people back together because obviously being at the table and seeing all of you is really important. So thank you all. Have a great week. And, and your Chamber of Commerce is here and available to serve you. Thank you. Thank you.